Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Margo, and I'm the manager of public programs here at the Brooklyn Museum. I take they, them pronouns. It is an honor to welcome you to our Brooklyn Talks this evening in celebration of the opening of Oscar Yeho, East of Sun, West of Moon. I am joined on stage by American Sign Language interpreter Jason Farr and later Johnny Cologne. We have seats reserved on the right side of aisle three and four for anyone who would like a direct view of the interpreters. Before we delve into our program, I would like to name that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of Lenape Delaware Nation. May we use this moment as one of many moments to reckon with the contested history of this space and of this land, and to attune ourselves to the presences and absences we're in, to consider who is here and who is not here, who has been here and who has not been here, which languages are and are not actively spoken here. This program will begin with a conversation between Oscar Yeho and fellow painters and collaborators Amanda Ba and Sasha Gordon, who also appear as sitters in the portraits in his exhibition. Their dialogue will be moderated by Eugenie Sai, who organized the exhibition alongside Indira Biskarun. We will culminate with audience Q&A, so please prepare your questions for then, and then after the program, we'll have a book signing. If you pre-ordered your copy of the book, you should have received it upon entry. We also have additional copies available for anyone who hasn't snagged theirs yet or who would like to gift one to a friend. With that, it is my pleasure to take a moment now to introduce our participants. Amanda Ba is a painter who lives and works between New York City and London. She was born in Columbus, Ohio, but spent the first five years of her life with her grandparents in Haifei, China. Diasporic heritage is central to her work. Vivid paintings that combine personal memory with psychosexual fantasy are populated with figures that challenge a predominantly white Western canon of figurative painting. Her work is also born out of her interest in critical race and queer theory, which helped to situate her identity within more nuanced frameworks of hybridity, otherness, and Chineseness. Let's hear it for Amanda. <laughs> Sasha Gordon lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. She studied painting at the Rhode Island School of Design. Gordon's paintings depict surreal scenes that explore a crossover between dreams and hyper-awareness. As if representing an out-of-body experience or a lucid dream, Gordon paints versions of herself to contend with the sense of unease that can occur when observing one's own image, behavior, or actions. Her most recent show, Hands of Others at Jeffrey Deitch, was the artist's first solo show in New York and was presented in collaboration with Matthew Brown, Los Angeles. Oscar Yeho was born in Liverpool and is now based in Brooklyn. He creates figurative paintings that, are often, that often explore the idea of what it means to be Asian American and the feeling of in-betweenness that comes with holding hybrid identities. He often paints his friends, many of whom, like Yeho, are artists themselves and identify as queer and part of the Asian diaspora. Set against layered backgrounds, his paintings also include his characteristic Chinese cowboy iconography, which places cowboy hats along yin-yang signs and juxtaposes Chinese calligraphy with American graffiti. He is exhibited with James Fuentes in New York and T293 Gallery in Rome, and was recently an artist in residence at Silver Arts Project in Four World Trade Center. Finally, last but not least, Eugenie Tsai is the John and Barbara Vogelstein Senior Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Brooklyn Museum. Her recent exhibitions at the Brooklyn Museum include Guadalupe Maravilla, Tierra Blanca Joven, Cause, What Party, The Slipstream, Reflection, Resilience, and Resistance in the Art of Our Time, the Brooklyn Museum's presentation of the Obama portraits, and of course, Oscar Yeho, East of Sun, West of Moon, which just opened last week. Without further ado, please help in giving a warm Brooklyn welcome to Amanda, Eugenie, Oscar, and Sasha. Good evening, everyone. And Thanks for joining us tonight for this conversation with Oscar, Sasha, and Amanda. On the occasion of Oscar's show, East of Sun, West of Moon, which is upstairs in, on the fourth floor and will be open after the conversation for, for viewing. I'm not sure, oh yes, you're gonna be down here signing books and people are gonna be waiting for books or up in the galleries looking at his work. So we thought we'd open 
by showing some images by, of works by each of the artists. Um, I'm sure many of you know, are familiar with their work already, but for those of you who aren't, it will be really helpful to see um, examples. And for those of you who are, it is always a pleasure to see work by these three artists. I have no idea the order in which <laughs> these appear. So here's the clicker, and um, you can do it yourself, or I can just click through. But let's see, I think maybe you're up. Okay, yeah. you want to do it yourself? Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so yeah, this uh, <laughs> this painting, birds of feather, oh, flock together. Oh, you know, I think we talked about showing one example of your early work and one of your later work. We did, yeah. yeah. This is this was 2020. This was two years ago. Uh, I did this during. Um, I was on a studio abroad in Paris, and then COVID happened, and then in March, and I was trapped in my uh, parents' home in Liverpool. So I was just painting for that period, and I did this during that time. Um, and it includes you, Amanda, <laughs> and my friend Morgan. And I, everyone was around the world, so I asked them to take reference pictures of themselves, and then I kind of stitched it all together in the painting. Um, and yeah, this is one of the pieces also in the um, show upstairs. What to say about this? I guess, let's look at the, should I compare it to the, how, how do I go move forward? That thing. The okay, big the big green button, yeah. okay. So yeah, this is um, a new piece I did for the show, this is 2022. Um, Sayonara Susie Wong's, aka at the Opium Den. Uh, and this also features Amanda um, and her partner, Justin. So I guess for kind of, well, I specifically wanted to pick these two pieces because they're both group portraits. And you can kind of, I guess, see the progression, at least for the two years. I think that's why we decided to talk about early works and later work. Um, is that for this piece, I was also doing a residency at the World Trade Center, the 28th floor, and the light was really um, <coughs> intense. And so actually for a lot of the pieces in the show, there's a one more kind of dramatic sense of light and dark. Uh, but for both the pieces, um, you can see I'm kind of exploring um, what I, I guess is called Chinese, Chinese cowboy iconography, or the kind of fusion of these like Western uh, symbols, the kind of old West, the mythic American West, um, with kind of more um, East Asian uh, iconography. And you can also see um, another part of my work deals with kind of um, depicting people that um, I have a kind of relationship with. And I often depict that symbolically. So you can kind of see on the left there, there's um, the three, the butterfly, the crane, and the goat, um, each symbolizing um, us. Um, in this painting, you can see similar thing with the ox and the butterfly and the crane to symbolize Amanda, Justin, and I, and through my works, I've symbolized a man with a butterfly, because you have a tattoo, right? Butterfly, butterfly tattoo, so that's why. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I'll say on that. Should we move, move on? Hello. Um, uh, this piece was a different, I took a different route with it. Usually I kind of use imagery from uh, my childhood, which was, you know, upstate New York, so very bucolic and suburban. And I kind of take memories from childhood and kind of build off of them. And this one I wanted to be a little bit more fantastical and almost uh, lucid dreamlike. So I kind of started with this idea of, it's like reservoir, <clears throat> but also this like dance floor and I was trying to think of like the earliest, you know, media I saw as a young girl, like of Asian woman, and I remember the Harajuku girls from like Gwen Stefani's music videos, which was at the time I thought cool, but it's actually really fucked up because <laughs> they're just like they don't talk and they're just dressed in like kawaii schoolgirl uniforms. So 
Um, I kind of wanted to take that into my own paintings, and I think it's like the first one where I kind of had these like costumes in the work, and um, yeah, this piece talks a lot about like the exoticization and sexualization of Asian women. Um, yeah, next one. Big button. Um, this was a very intense painting for me. Um, it's kind of like a love letter to myself, or that's how I see it as. Um, it's very intimate. It's like kind of like two versions of myself on this, almost like a date on a rowboat. And the one in the foreground is offering a bouquet of her hair to the one in the back. And she's kind of um, looking at her with like this disgusted expression. And um, I was kind of diving into like a lot of my, you know, mental illness problems. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I suffer from like OCD and I have had like trichotillomania in the past, which is where you like pluck your hair out. And um, it's, you know, it's like a form of anxiety. And I think from my upbringing, I was always very anxious and aware of my surroundings because it was kind of like what I needed to do to survive. Um, so I think this is kind of a very like loving painting to myself, but also, you know, I still like recognize like issues that are still happening, you know, in society. Um, this is my most recent one. So vulnerable. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I was showing in Denmark and you know, it's like they don't really show like people of color, like artists of color there. So I kind of uh, wanted to like reference our history in this one, like obviously like Botticelli and Winslow Homer and um, kind of paint myself in this like alabaster skin. And yeah, I just really wanted to focus on, you know, one figure with this one, like, um, really want to emphasize how isolated she was, but you know, like yearning for connection. Um, oh, it's really dark. Um, yeah, I also kind of was referencing our history with this one, you know, like Artemisia and um, Velasquez. And um, I think like painting is very intimate and, you know, I, I find it really interesting when artists paint themselves painting um, because there's like a lot of like, you know, unspoken things about it. There's another one, okay, um, <laughs> sorry. I don't know why I added so many. Um, yeah, I took like That's an anatomy great. class uh, my senior year of college and um, I was kind of like returning to like naturalistic colors, but I still wanted to like play around with like um, the style of painting and the figure. So I kind of like accentuated her gaze and I was looking a lot at like Yoshimoto Nara and like, you know, the very sparkly, innocent eyes, but also, um, yeah, there's something kind of enticing about her and seductive. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess we'll start with, this is the oldest, oh, this is, this painting is actually 2021, I think. Um, don't worry, <laughs> don't, don't worry. Um, this is like um, an older painting. It's funny that we're saying like older work and newer work because it's all like really within the span of like two years, which is, um, but this painting is like part of the series I made when I first started like showing in galleries. Like I think around this time when I, make, when I made this painting, my like career hadn't really um, begun yet actually. I made this when I was like living in a derelict pub in London off of unemployment money. Um, so, uh, this was part of a series in which I started, um, this is around the time I started, like, bringing my interest in theory into my artworks, and then my, the two sort of converged, and then my paintings changed a lot. So, at this time, I was reading a lot of, um, Donna Haraway and Mel Chen, um, stuff about post-human theory, and, uh, Donna Way, um, Hara, Donna Haraway has a, <laughs> Donna Way for short, <laughs> has a whole book about um, 
dogs, basically, and as sort of our historical and societal relationship to dogs and other animals. So there's a whole series of um, just like one woman, one dog, and it's kind of sad because there's four of these, they're all the same size. Um, as I made each one, they sort of left the studio. I've never been in the same room as all of them, and they haven't been in the same room together. And I would like to have them reunited one day. Um, and then around this time, I think a lot of people like started knowing me as like the girl who painted with red a lot. So then I showed them. <laughs> well, that's not me. Um, but yeah, so then this is uh, part of my more recent solo show. My first solo was in London. And um, I sort of like made all the work for that in one go. And I had the idea for the show before I started making the works. So this show was like a bit like writing a, a, a thesis or something in which like every painting was like a chapter of this larger idea that I had already preconceived. And the show is around giantesses. And it has a lot of references to a sort of like rhizome of, of things. Um, this one has a Greco-Roman reference um, about the myth of Narcissus. I think Caravaggio also has a really cool painting of Narcissus. And with this one, I was pushing the concept. I was also pushing the color palette. I hadn't really done a pale painting before. And then this was sort of the um, painting that like summed up the solo show I felt like the best. Um, it's called Titanomachia, another Greco-Roman reference, but they all didn't all have that. And uh, I was looking at like Leon Golub has some really cool paintings of um, giants and titans fighting. Um, he has a lot of paintings about like violence in America. Um, I really like his work, and with this one, then the technical challenge was sort of creating a very big, um, multi-figural uh, sort of frieze-like, very long tableau of of, um, of a painting, and that's probably my most recent um, work that I have to show right now. Oh, that's great! Thank you. Um, well, clearly the three of you embrace the figure in your own really distinctive way. So I'm wondering how you all made the decision to focus on the human body. And I also wonder if your interest, it seems that your interest in figuration is maybe one of the ways you met. And um, I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. Can anyone speak to that? Yes. Um, I, uh, to answer the first part of the question, <clears throat> I've just always painted figures and people. I think that's what people start out doing, is you know, you draw faces, you, you, you draw like an eye in your like, oh, notebook or whatever. When you're a child. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Drawing like, I love drawing the um, anime eyes, you know. Um, only the right one, though. Only the right one, yeah. <laughs> only one side of the face. Um, but. It's just something that has always, I think, interested me. I, th I think, in general, I like to think I'm like a human-oriented person and kind of belief and practice. And so it makes sense that I'm, you know, painting these representations of people. And obviously, there's loads of different ways you can represent a person and humanity that doesn't necessitate painting like an, a head, an arm, and head, a pair of arms, and a pair of legs. Um, but, you know, it's the most kind of, I think for me, the, mo the most natural way to express the kind of, I don't know, human condition. How about you guys? Yeah, it's interesting because, like, um, I mean, Sasha and I have talked about how, like, whether we consider our paintings as, like, portraiture or not, because yours is portraiture. They're very, like, tender and intimate portraits of people that you know that are accurate to their likeness. And with us, we sort of, like, use our own likeness as, like, a base model for um, characters, like in, like when you customize your default character in like Skyrim or something, you know? Um, and, you know, we don't, at least for me, I'm not too concerned with staying true to my own likeness. I don't really couldn't even consider them portraits of myself. Um, yeah, I feel like as we kind of both keep painting, I feel like our versions of ourselves kind of keep altering, you know? 
um, I think it's like a nice thing to like kind of like start off with yourself because um, I don't know, I, I was painting other people for a while and it was kind of hard for me to put a lot of like, like my paintings are very personal, so trying to put that onto other figures that aren't myself just kind of felt not right for me. So um, I think I always just started painting myself and then kind of, you get kind of like artistic freedom and you can kind of like change each appearance a little bit and yeah. Yeah, you can take a lot of liberties with like sort of making your own likeness more grotesque or <laughs> sort of stretching it in different directions. I mean, I have done like a portrait or two in the past and I always like approach it so differently. I, I do try to make it like um, a, at least somewhat flattering or flattering in, in sentiment mm -hmm. um, image of the person. And I think like since I don't use models yet, um, like I would feel a bit strange just you know, having someone like come in and take photos and then just like really m like manipulate their likeness into a sort of avatar. Yeah, it's like never, easier to do it with myself. I never thought about that, yeah. That would be kind uh, of weird. But can I just yeah. ask Oscar, you had, I know when we looked at some of your works upstairs, the Goku and Kato in particular, yeah. and you very insistently told me these were not self-portraits, even though I thought, oh, there's Oscar. And you said, no, those are not no, no, no. self-portraits. Um, they are, I guess I like that word character, but, um, but you did talk about performing a role, and I'm not sure if that's what you're also talking about, Amanda and Sasha, or if there's some difference. Well, yeah, so agreeing with what Amanda and Sasha have said, that's um, kind of why for the show upstairs, the, the Coolism's room, the figures which they're kind of based off me, but they're not really intended to look like me. In a, in a, I've done some portraits in the past that are intended to look like me, um, but for very similar reasons, I wanted to, I feel like there's a lot of kind of ethical restraints and considerations when you paint another person, when you do a portrait of them. Um, and whereas when you paint kind of these avatars or characters that aren't really based on anyone in particular, but they're kind of based off you, you're allowed to take more liberties and you can like have them be all weird and like in weird compromising positions and stuff. Um, and that's kind of why for, it's also part having these figures, um, the Coolism series perform particular manifestations of, um, I guess, kind of representations of East Asian masculinity in the West. Um, so they aren't, they aren't me, but it's kind of like, they're based off me, so in a sense, I'm like performing this character that's not meant to be me in, in a way. You know, it's, it's like you're putting like a wig and like a mustache and like a hat. Or a or you're trying to, you're performing at someone who's not you, but ultimately kind of looks like you. Um, and kind of the intention was that with that series is also to try and show the kind of um, ways that, you know, specifically um, with East Asian people, the kind of um, trope that we all look the same. Um, it's a way to kind of, um, I guess, to show the kind of, being able to perform a character and someone who looks like you but isn't you, and you get mistaken for that other person like being mistaken for someone else, I've, I, that's happened to me a lot. Uh, my cousins, yes. my brothers, <laughs> random Asian people. Um, and I think, you know, it, it can be very annoying, but it, it must be a blessing to be the kind of, a, kind of essentially a fugitive to evade kind of specific identification or classification, to be able to slip in and out of different kind of personhoods or characters. I think in a way it can be kind of, um, I don't know, cool and... Um, I don't want to say empowering, I think of a different word. Um, it can be a way to evade kind of, um, you know, people. Multiple identities or por porosity? I'm just, I'm just kind of curious. But, but you did do this incredible portrait of Sasha, which, and I'm wondering, and clearly it is, I believe, intended to be Sasha. Yes. And her, and her, her dog. So, how, and then Amanda appears in your work seemingly as Amanda. And 
So I'm wondering how you make those decisions um, and then also as sitters, how you feel being painted by Oscar and if you're like backseat painters giving him advice as you're posing or you know, do you weigh in afterwards and say, oh, you know, I don't like this or that or do you, do you let him have, you know, just his artistic freedom and to, to paint you as he, as he wishes? It's awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, it's it's um it's really flattering to be um to have so many like portraits of me over sort of these like um, many years now. Many years. It's like periodic, and they're kind of space. It's like we kind of grow together. Um, I don't know. Every time it's just been like come in, take a photo, and then I sort of like walk out, and I don't think about it again till it's done. <laughs> or maybe you send me an update, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any sort of concerns about how you will portray me. So it's, yeah, I have total freedom. So that suggests a high level of trust. Yeah, I also like, you know, I already use my own likeness in sort of uh, debased ways. So <laughs> I'm like, maybe, I don't know if it could get worse than that. I mean, I, I think this is my first time someone's painted me. So I feel very honored. Um, I look really good. Um, yeah, but I think, I mean, I remember like when I used to do like commission work, like sometimes people would be like, oh, this doesn't look like the person it's supposed to be. You know, it's like, yeah. so I was very trusting. Like, obviously I knew you would do me justice, but I was very curious to see how it would turn out. But I feel like you really did capture like my essence in like a sculptural way. Like I just always admire your use of color and the um, texture of the surface. Thanks. I feel like I, I made you look really like mean in the painting, like really like don't fuck with me kind of vibe. I do have a resting pitch <laughs> face. <laughs> so. actually, actually you're like an incredibly like friendly and like kind person. So just wanted to make Thank that you. clear. I'm very goofy. <laughs> So my parents were immigrants and I grew up in the suburbs. So when I was reading a little bit about you, I, I couldn't help noticing that you all spent some of your childhood, if not all of your childhood, in suburbs. Um, Oscar, I think, uh, um, Liverpool, Amanda, Columbus, and um, Sasha, upstate New York. And um, I'm wondering, what that was like for you, and, and if you think that impact, growing up in the suburbs impacted your artistic vision and expectations. Okay, I'll go first again. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Liverpool. Um, I was like an internet kid. I like stayed inside and played League of Legends all the time. I love the first- You played what? League of Legends, it's a very popular. <laughs> Video game. You're gonna have to fill me in on this, okay. I'll, I'll tell you later. I used to be addicted, it was pretty bad. But um, I love the kind of first art actually that I was making um, was internet art. Like I would have a graphics tablet and I would draw pictures of like Pokemon, um, a bunch of different animes and stuff like that. Um, and I honestly got a kind of rudimentary art education just by looking at kind of online tutorials. Um, and, and, and was this like you said internet art, but then you also mentioned drawing and... Yeah, so I would like draw basically on a graphics tablet and I would upload it to the internet. That, it's not like, inter, like conceptual internet art. This is like very like... The you first it. NFTs. <laughs> the first NFTs, yeah. Um, but I think it influenced me being in the suburbs because I was very much like, I have to get out of here. Um, and also, I had a very, I was very online and I think I first... Um, encountered Sasha's work on Instagram like a long time ago through this. I think probably like end of high school, I think. End of high school, yeah. yeah. So I think because I lived in a, I mean, obviously towards the end of high school, I grew up in the city, it was obviously a thing. And in um, specifically Liverpool, growing up, I would do a lot of portraits of my friends being like drunk at house parties and stuff, uh, underage and everything. Um, so that's like one specific way being in the city has influenced my practice. But I think being in the suburbs was more about, influenced me in the sense that it forced me to kind of see community through different means. So kind of like online or like, yeah. 
Yeah, I was very online as well. I um, had a deviant art page. I thought I, I was gonna be art. like um, like when I was thirteen, I thought I was gonna be like a Instagram celebrity hyper realism portrait girl. I think I did like a drawing of Ali Harvard from America's Next Top Model, and I tagged her, and she reposted it, and that was a very big deal for me <laughs> at the time. Um, but yeah, Ohio is a crazy place. Um, it is it is very suburban, um, sort of like very like high school American movie, middle class white picket fence, a lot of sports. You're sort of stranded from any like metropolitan center until you drive and um, very white, needless to say. And I also wanted to run away, but you know, I don't know, maybe Ohio has been like gaining in popularity over the years. I don't, maybe like you guys have like noticed there's been a lot of like memes circulating about Ohio. There's a sort of like mystic romanticism surrounding Ohio now. And um, and yeah, on TikTok, it's all the comments are like, only in Ohio. Yeah, like, is yeah. this Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, now I think as I'm older and I've gotten a bit more distance, I'm actually planning like maybe um, like a solo show next year in Ohio about Ohio sort of like reinterrogating um, uh, immigrant communities in the suburbs and their sort of proliferation in these middle American cities. And I mean, it, I, I'm aboard the Ohio mystic romanticism train. It's time to go back. I haven't been, but I would love to go with you. Come through. <laughs> yeah, I might. Um, yeah, I grew up in Westchester, so um, very conservative, a lot of white people. Um, all there is to do is just play sports and um, yeah, it was hard. I like really hated it being there and I was also, I mean, I'm biracial, so I always felt like I had to choose, you know, if I was white or Asian and that was really confusing. I was always kind of in this uh, gray area and I really did consider myself white for like the majority of my life, which is really uh, upsetting. <laughs> but um, so I kind of used my art to like, you know, make up for lost time in that way and yeah I remember also being like a tumblr girl like 2012 was like peak tumblr and I would just draw like Lana Del Rey and Marina and the Diamonds also like those like models like Sky Ferreira and all that and I'd hope for the best and <laughs> I was like wow I'm like really doing this and it's just like so like superficial but I like loved doing that at the time and then I you know I went to like uh after school programs for art, just like local art centers. And I think I was just painting, um, you know, like copies, like master copies of uh, like the Starry Night and uh, any like Monet painting. And I kind of learned from that. And that was like a very uh, nice thing to have because um, I really didn't enjoy, you know, my environment, so. So how did you three meet? Instagram? <laughs> I, think I met him in college. college. Yeah, we went to college You're together. my first friend. And you were not my first friend, <laughs> but you were a friend. I was a friend, yeah. <laughs> but me and Sasha, I think we followed each other on Instagram for a long time, and then Sasha moved to New York. Yeah, almost two years ago. And yeah. I was in um, Providence, Rhode Island, so I you know, rarely came to the city for four years, so... We finally like reconnected, I think, last year. Um, and it's been really nice, yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, uh, just so I don't sound really mean, I'm a year older, or I'm one grade above Oscar. So it would be sad for me if Oscar was my first friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amanda actually influenced my decision also to come to college in New York, specifically Columbia, because I wasn't sure the visual arts program and then someone showed me her work and I was like, wow, this shit's amazing. And then I reached out to you, and I think we FaceTimed. And then, yeah, and then I went to Columbia. So thanks for that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you think about race, invisibility, representation when making your work? Following up on the suburbs question. Um, 
because I'm curious to hear your thoughts about representation and whether you, or not you think it serves a, a purpose or is, in, or is productive in any way. Because I think I've read some comments, at, I, I mean, I'm forgetting who said what, but I have come across some comments about representation, some of the stuff I read about you in here. Um, yeah, I write about it in my book. Um, it's kind of, I think, representation is, um, it should be a means to an end, um, not an end in itself. It's kind of like, I think people talk about having a seat at the table, but what if like the table's like, it has mold on it, or the table like sits on like the backs of others. Like what if trying so hard to achieve representation at this table actually does a huge disservice to people? Or maybe the, um, the table shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, so I think, you know, representation doesn't necessarily do much to change um, the fundamental ways um, that a power, of, of a power structure, the way a power structure might work. Um, you don't think it could be a first step? It could be a first step, yes. Um, but like I said, it should only be a means to a... A means to an end. An end, yeah. I think just representation by itself, I think, doesn't necessarily do much. Um, obviously, visibility can be really um, important. Um, being able to perceive, see, consuming and seeing images of people of your likeness in positions of power, I think, can really, you know, encourage you to also attain those positions and stuff. Um, the visibility sometimes is um, a trap. Um, yeah, yeah, you have to sort of like interrogate the positions of power as well. It's not just, um, well, you write about this a lot in your book. Um, you say it's the neoliberal recuperation of identity politics, which is essentially what you just um, sort of summarized. Yeah, it's kind of like um, the use of diversity and of representation is used as a kind of alibi um, to kind of skirt around actual like fundamental change that you can have. In, the, in a book, I bring up this example of you can have a kind of like gay POC uh, CEO of like Exxon or like an oil <laughs> company. And then, so now we just have a gay POC pumping oil into the ocean. Um, that's the kind of, I think, <laughs> that's just one extreme example, but that's the kind of ways in which you know, representation or the expression of like, diversity and a minority identity um, can be used actually just as a cover, as an alibi to right. hide kind of bad things happening. Right. Structural inequities, climate, yeah, e yeah I hear what you're saying. Um, anyone else? Any other comments on that? Since, since representation seems to be a big thing these days. Oh, I guess so, I mean, I feel like for me, it's like I kind of look into like the psychological effects of racism and how it's affected me. And um, I think, I mean, yeah, my work is very personal. It's like my own experience and narrative, but I think like it's still contextualized by what's going on. Um, and I, I, I do think representation is important, but I think it, you know, it's very easy for it to be, uh, you know, surface level. Um, so I feel like we are kind of trying to put more dimension into that. Um, well, the queer female body shows up in all of your work. So can you talk about your depictions of um, women? And, I, I'm, and I'm assuming you're working against various tropes of East Asian women. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I haven't um, been back to China in like th almost three years now, and uh, because of because of COVID and border restrictions. And I think I'm very interested to go back. I think I know for sure when I go back, I will feel bad about my body there. Um, and I think you Can know, I ask why. Yeah, well, like, I have really big feet. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm tall, I stand out, I dress American, and I'm not very slender. So I think, like, there are very specific um, beauty standards that 
I, I know that I will not um, be able to assimilate into. And so, but that stuff does just sort of like wear on you, you know, like you feel good in one place, contextualized by one thing, you go somewhere else and, you know, you stand out and you, you know, suddenly have to reinterrogate how you feel about yourself. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of what we do is trying to go against the image of like the, like demure, uh, sort of ornamental, um, quiet, uh, subservient, and petite. Um, yeah, the whole woman. like lotus blossom like stereotype is being very like subservient and obedient and you know quiet. Yeah. Right. There's also the hypersexualized. Yeah. Asian woman. And I think it's interesting to like try to paint nudes that are very unsexy. Like it's difficult to even project um, lust or desire onto it because there's a sort of grotesque or sort of monstrous or perturbing quality that um, refuses uh, sexualization. I just I don't think it's like ooh sexy image, you know. When you I look think at you everything. used a term in your when you were talking about your show at AMPM. What was it? It was oh my god, it was kind of perfect, but not. Um, un, oh yeah, it might come to me later on. Um, so I'm trying to think of the. How about you, Oscar? Yeah, I painted some very sexy men for my show. Okay, because we talked a lot about feminization of men, and and also um, you do reference Sayonara and World of Susie Wong's yeah. painting, which a painting Amanda is in, and Justin and yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think um, any type of like race and gender are so intertwined process of racialization, the way in which people are assigned a race in society is a process in which particular aspects and qualities and traits are assigned to you and those are often gendered. So with East Asian-ness or with yellow people, with yellow women for example, it's kind of hyper-feminization. With um, East Asian men, it's kind of the process of being considered like East Asian or yellow in the West is also one of being like, you know, effeminized essentially. Um, but yeah, so in the show I have kind of these like beefy, beefcake, these beefcake Asian dudes. Um, <laughs> but the, the intent isn't necessarily to say that like East Asian men can be masculine. I'm not too concerned with trying to like protect the integrity of masculinity. Um, I kind of was trying to take it from a queer angle in the sense that kind of visual imagery of like Tom of Finland, um, these kind of really hyper-sexualized like caricatures of masculinity. Um, that's why I wanted to do, especially for the, the, whip, the whip painting in the show, um, was in a way to try and I guess, um, it's like through a caricature of gender, you can kind of destabilize it through a caricature of like masculinity through a queer character of masculinity, you can kind of destabilize the integrity of it in the sense that you can have a gay man, an effeminate gay man, dress up in a particular way, work out enough, do enough steroids, wear enough leather, and then be seen as like more masculine than a straight guy. Um, which I think kind of goes back to what you mentioned before about performance, being able to perform masculinity better than the straight guys can, kind of destabilizes its whole uh, integrity. Um, Yeah, I paint a lot about bodies, and um, yeah, I think you know, painting my body is a way of like solidif solidifying my presence. Um, you know, I think like I was so affected by my environment growing up that I actually just like didn't really um, consider myself like a person. Like I really just uh, dissociated a lot of the time, and I think. Um, painting myself. Is this your suburban environment? Yes. <laughs> like I was just like trauma West dumped Chester. about this. Yeah, I, I, West I understand. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it's always been really important for me to paint, um, you know, myself and like people in my likeness. And 
Um, yeah. yeah. There is like an, another aspect where like, I feel like um, I, I get a lot of like questions or sort of things positioning me as a, a woman painter who is very concerned with women bodies. And that's like very boring and outdated and uh, lacks a lot of intersectionality. Like I feel like it's, it's kind of matter of fact to us when we paint women's bodies. It doesn't feel like we're trying to Make like a huge like make statement. a huge groundbreaking yeah. shocking statement that will like throw the male gaze like on its back or something like that. It's like um, it's it's very natural and it's about the care around the other things um, in the painting that sort of fill out this this profile. Like right, I think it it's important you know that it comes from us because I mean I I love like Namio Harakawa and. Um, Wei Dong, but they do paint, you know, Asian women in this very, like, still kind of fetishized, very obviously fetishized way, and I think um, with me and Amanda's work, it's, like, very clear that, you know, we are of these backgrounds, and it, like, doesn't look like we're coming from this kind of, like, perverted, like, perspective. It's just an obvious uh, fact of our condition, and then what yeah, we we're add, just, like, living as when then what people. we add on is is the part that we make decisions about. Um, well, the three of you have, I mean, I, I saw your show, Sasha, at, at Deitch this summer, which was amazing. And Amanda, I was in London, and Oscar told me I should go see your show at AM, PM. So I was able to see your giantesses in all of their glory. And then, of course, Oscar's showing here. So you're all experiencing success. And I'm wondering how you think about that and also just about success in general. I mean, what does that mean these days? There traditionally have been paths to success, um, which involve getting an, a BFA or a BA and then an MFA and then getting gallery representation in museum shows. And so in terms of that trajectory, do you feel that you're de redefining that? Or do you feel a desire to redefine that traditional path? Or do you feel that you might be undoing it or unmaking it in any way? Because you do seem to undo and unmake so many other things. I'm wondering if you're also rethinking this as well. And um, So I'm curious to, see, to hear if you think there are any new paths for artistic validation. I do think it's interesting because I feel like when I started college, I thought like I'd have to get an MFA and then do a bunch of residencies and probably like only gain success in my like mid thirties. Like that was just like under, that was what my, um, that's what I thought it would be like. But um, I think like with this whole idea of like emerging artists is kind of, um, I mean, it's still like present. Like I think like we're so young, like we're only two or three years out of college. Um, so it's still like, we do get kind of like judged from being so young, but at the same time, I think it's kind of slowly dissolving. Like I think the like, You mean judged is not being... Like qualified or uh -huh. like our work isn't as worth more because we're so young, like we just graduated. Um, but it's like Oscar just had a show here and he's 24, freshly 24. Know, aren't so. you all 24? I'll be 25 soon. Oh. <laughs> I'm the <laughs> eldest. This is a rare overlap. We are all 24, actually, right now. That's true. Yeah. Well, okay. Look it up while it lasts. <laughs> yeah, success is a, is a double-edged sword, I think, especially in the art world. I think, um, like, when I was making that first series of paintings, I was like, oh, good, I'm going to maybe make some money off of this. And then it was like the floodgates opened, and it was ugly inside. Um, it's a lot of it's a lot of navigating your own agency, navigating um, sort of uh, your own personal code of ethics, um, while still trying to be able to support yourself. And a lot of it is about luck and timing. I think it's you know it's not just a meritocracy where uh, we get to have shows because um, of us. I mean. 
we're at a time when emerging artists are becoming very popular. We're downstream of BLM and the, the market likes us, you know. Huh? The market likes us. The market know. really likes us, and after you know anti-Asian violence, which was definitely downstream of BLM, um, the art world was so, the art world was sort of forced into a a sharp recognition of artists who are young, queer, and POC. And that is all timing. You know, if we came and graduated five years before, five years later, like it's unclear what would have happened. And so I think um, success really is owed to a lot of different factors. And um, I think it's not all about sort of climbing up the ladder till you eventually reach a blue chip gallery. You meet a lot of like bosses, boss battles <laughs> along the way <laughs> that you, where you're like, oh shit, this feels very unethical. Like this is, this is bad. Um, I used to admire you and now you are bad. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's about navigating it and ultimately, ultimately I think having some sort of um, cultural, like lasting cultural significance would be a comfortable marker of success for me. I think for me, success was a very pragmatic thing. Or throughout, I, I wanted to stay in the US and I'm a foreign national. So throughout my um, student visa was five years, was four years of college plus one year of work authorization. So I kind of, and then after that, it's like you have to either get a visa, get married, or just go home. And I, um, throughout college was really aware that I really wanted to, you know, have a life in New York City. I'd spent, you know, my time in New York in college kind of building this community. And so for me, success was kind of a pragmatic thing. It was being able to, right now I'm on an artist visa, to O1 visa. Um, you have to apply with a portfolio of right. things. You have to be exceptional. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, for me, was a main metric of success was can I stay in this country? Can I successfully apply for this visa? Can I be financially in independent? It's not like I had like a trust fund or anything to rely on. So it was about kind of being able to like, survive and like live and like legally stay in the US and New York. Um, and as soon as I got that kind of like, like that was such a major, major, major source of anxiety for me all throughout college. Um, and when I finally got the artist visa, a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. I was like, okay, that's it. I can, I can be done for a while. Um, so for me, success was more based on really kind of um, pragmatic things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask one question. And so I hope you people out there in the audience are thinking of questions because we'll have Q&A um, for our three artists here. So looking down the road, do you have any dream projects that you'd like to work on and bring to fruition? What are they? Hopes uh, and dreams. <laughs> I've always said that I would love to make a public sculpture one day. I think, um, like I really liked Nicole Eisenman's sculpture at the Biennial, like this was years ago now, but um, I don't know if that, I mean, it was an outside sculpture and it, I could, totally see it as a public sculpture. Um, so I just love to make something like large scale and lasting and you know, like I love looking at public sculptures. I think they really like bring character to an area and I, I always look at them and I, and I really enjoy them. So. Would this be a figurative public, um, a figurative sculpture do you think? And maybe figures that resemble your the figures in your painting? Or? Yeah, could be. I mean, if someone asked me to make a public sculpture like tomorrow, that would be what I would make. But in the time that it would take me to get a proposal for a public sculpture, I mean, I, I could be making anything. Who knows? How about you, Sasha? Um, I would love to just make a bunch of paintings that no one sees. Um, oh, secret paintings. Because I, <laughs> I don't know, I feel like I've just been like nonstop since college, which has been like, obviously very privileged, but I, I feel like, you know, I, I'm always interested in like what my work would look like if I wasn't showing and I could take some time to like experiment a little bit. Um, so I really want to like maybe make paintings of friends and also just like really ugly 
paintings just for myself. And then also I was thinking about sculpture. Like I feel like I always have conversations with like Amanda or just like any figurative artist, you mm -hmm. know, a painter, artist, like, you know, what would your sculptures look like if you decided to go into that? And I, yeah, it's something I've been thinking about for a while. So, yeah. Wow, that's exciting. How about you, Oscar? Sculpture would be cool. I did this from his <laughs> class. And then I made like this really, did you see it? I made this like gold, like a very central, I, I put a jock strap on it. No, and is then, it the one that you destroyed? Huh? I think you it, it fell off. It fell off oh. my ex's bed. And it broke and shot into a million pieces. And I kept the pieces thinking I would glue it together, but I didn't. So I'd love to get back into the ceramics. But besides that, I would like to do like, a really, really big painting. Um, How big? Huge, massive. Like mural? <laughs> no, not mural. <laughs> but like, I don't know, that, that big or something. But it's just like, it's, as an artist, it's like, uh, I'm not really at the point yet where I can afford to like take off a lot of months. Because I, I think, I don't know if you guys find this, but like smaller works generally are more profitable because you can make them in less time and they sell for a large amount. And, like, and people can put them in their homes. Yeah, like it takes exponentially more time to work, make a work as it grows in size. Um, but I love making large paintings. Um, I can paint for like hours and stuff, but um, there's always a kind of um, need to be selling works to pay rent and stuff. So I would like to take like half a year just to work on one single painting. I think that could be fun. Sounds like a residency project. Yeah, you're right, actually, yeah. Okay, anything else you'd like to say before we turn it over to questions? Congratulations on your show, Oscar. Yay. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are mics in both aisles, and you should feel free to go up and ask a question if you have one. And maybe it's kind of dark. No questions. Hmm. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Pleasure to hear you all speak about your art, um, kind of going off of the idea of success and um, being such young artists, taking the world by storm so quickly. Um, do you have any advice, guidance, words of wisdom, things you've learned in your experience for um, young aspiring painters, fine artists in school currently? Maybe you've already heard that question a million times, but I would like to know the answer. <laughs> Take your time. Um, there, there's, you know, there's a real um, sort of capital placed on succeeding young these days. There's always, you know, 30 under 30 lists, um, ID mags list of young and there's this, there's this, there, you're made to feel like there's this very brief window of time before you're like expired basically. And that's just not the case. So don't be discouraged if it, doesn't seem to happen exactly when you want it to. And also, you know, protect yourself. You're not at the whim of somebody else who wants to exploit you for your work. And in the beginning, you know, I said yes to everything, even when it felt bad. But then once you're in a position where you can say no, you can definitely say no. Yeah, I feel like in the beginning, it's kind of inevitable to just, you kind of have to like say yes to a lot of things and then you do get to a place where you can kind of be picky and decide what exactly you want. Um, but yeah, there really is no rush. I feel like um, a lot of us were showing, all of us were showing in college. And, um, you know, I had a lot of friends that were kind of stressed because they weren't showing. And, um, but now they're all like, you know, showing in group shows and everything. Like, I think it really does kind of just take time and just keep putting your work like out on Instagram and having a website. I actually only had one show that I showed in, in college, and Oscar curated that show. So Period. yeah, help your friends out and accept help from your friends. Yeah, I would say a few things. Firstly, yeah, I, I low-balled myself, I undervalued myself when I first started out. Like, someone wanted to buy my painting, and I gave them a discount, and they were like, no, I want it cheaper. And I was like, okay, fuck, like, I'm worth nothing. So just ignore them. <laughs> Also, learn to, learn to say no. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of bad people. Oh, out there. and keep, keep a lot of your work. 
that's what I regret. I sold things very fast. And I think it's good to like keep onto some things. Yeah. I think I um, achieved commercial success early on because I had a, I, I knew Photoshop, so I knew how to, I would bo borrow someone's camera on campus and take a, a really professional photo of it, edit it on Photoshop, have a website, I had an Instagram presence. Um, but I kind of, I, I worked as an assistant for a friend of mine, Louis Rotino. Um, and honestly, working, it was through him that a bunch of other people found out about me. So that was my, and now we're really good friends. And it was through that that um, I was able to kind of find my community. And then it was really kind of word of mouth uh, for me. Um, but yeah, I think the one piece of advice I would give would, yes, it's, it's important to take your time. And also a lot of young artists burn out really quickly. You burn bright, you burn fast. So I'm trying... I, I'm here for the long run, so I'm trying to take my time now. Um, I think also kind of take yourself as seriously, treat yourself as seriously as the way you deserve to be treated. So, you know, you, you're an artist, you should treat yourself like an artist. Um, yeah, it's kind of, and that means, you know, kind of respecting your own work and your own boundaries. Um, yeah, that's I think saying no, learning how to say no is a very important skill for everyone to learn. Hi. Uh, I know, Sasha and Amanda, you talked about color, but Oscar, I was very curious to um, just hear your thought process behind your color palette. I noticed that you use like a lot of primary colors, and I was wondering if that like ties into like the iconography of your like paintings, or yeah, I'd just love to hear more about that. Um, yeah, I use a lot of red. I do a lot of um, kind of under, I guess, under sketches with like red gouache. Um, red's like a very Chinese color. Um, and then I really love using the kind of electric blue. Um, I don't know where, they, where that kind of came from. Um, let me see. I mean, I don't really dress very colorfully, but my paintings are really colorful. Um, I think it's just, well, you know, at least for, if you look at like flags and stuff, they use kind of very vibrant colors, um, like the kind of stars, a yellow flag of a star is like flat color. Um, I'm always kind of pulling from that kind of iconography. Um, but yeah, I guess I don't really, sorry, that's not really a good answer. I'm not really sure how to answer that. It's kind of a natural thing that, that comes to me, I guess. Um, Sasha, earlier you you spoke about, well, you got really vulnerable and spoke about and opened up about your mental wellness um, within your painting. Um, I'm sure, I'm like really curious about the process behind whenever you guys actually paint and like create your creations. I'm sure it's a very cathartic process. Um, at what point, is there a certain piece that you did or, and this is for all three of you, or a certain point in a painting where you feel like you're like shattering the glass ceiling and you're like really feeling amazing. Like where do you get that high at a certain point in the process? That's a really good question. Um, I, I feel like I always hate starting a painting. Like I, I get really excited about the idea and then as soon as I um, kind of see like the blank canvas, I get super overwhelmed and then um, I kind of think as soon as I see all the pieces coming together and um, I love I love detail. So I think when I hit that point where I just get to do like the little hairs and um, sparkles in the eyes and paint the fabric, it's kind of um, really satisfying to me because um, I can finally see like the image as a whole. Yeah, I have like, there's like a arc uh, like an expositional arc where it's like the idea is great because you're just kind of laying in bed thinking about it and then um, sketching it out really messy on the canvas is also fun because you know you're probably going to cover it all later. The middle is like laborious and um, torturous honestly. <laughs> it, it, yeah, sometimes I have to take a break and like I used to paint only like one painting at a time but now I have to like Sometimes set it aside for a month and work on something else because 
you know. Yeah. Things will come to you, like, as you go. Yeah, the middle, you can really get stuck um, not knowing what it actually is going to look like. And then there's, like, a bit of a, a clearing um, towards the resolution where you do see it come together. You remember that you do know how to paint. <laughs> and then yeah. at the end, you get to add details, and it's, like... Do you work on good. multiple paintings, all of you? Trying to. I'm trying to. Yeah, I was, like notorious in college for only doing like one painting a semester and all my professors like hated hated me for that um and now I'm trying to like I think as I am working towards shows it's kind of necessary for me to work on multiple things at once and I, I do think it's actually very helpful um like for like the practice wise like you know I have to like let something dry and stuff like that but also I think um I kind of like not knowing how the painting mm -hmm the end product of the painting will be. And I think it's kind of fun to work more spontaneous and see where it goes. I think we all have pretty laborious, detail-oriented painting styles. Um, so yeah, I'm very similar. Like I've, I've tried working in multiple paintings, but I just get really obsessed with one painting. Um, yeah, it can be pretty, it's not very good for workflow. I have really bad workflow is what I've realized. Hi, um, I have a question. So, sorry, this is sort of back to the topic of the idea of the emergent artist and s how careful you have to be within that age range. Um, how do you guys personally feel about the idea, about the legacy of your artworks and who buys them? and how they treat it, you know, especially since all of your work is so personal and revolves around themes that are very sacred. Let's say in a hypothetical, some really rich, really white, evil people buy your work, you know, and don't treat it well and don't respect that. How do you guys feel about that? <laughs> that's definitely happened, I feel That like. happens, yeah. Oh, that's definitely happened. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in the beginning, you don't really have a choice. You say yes for money. Um, yeah, that's, I guess we'll, we'll talk shop. We'll be, we'll be blunt. Um, and then, you know, later on, you have to just ask for transparency from galleries. I always ask yeah. to include a clause in my consignment agreement in which I reserve the right to refuse to sell to a collector. Um, and I always make sure that the gallery is communicating with me about who is the collector, a bit about their collection, um, what's their collecting history, do they flip works? You know, if they have a history of flipping works within five years of buying it, it's like, no. And the gallery should have information on that, you know? If you're working with an ethical gallery, they should be happy to provide that kind of information. Yeah, I think it's also good to, like, talk to your friends about who they sell to, because I feel like a lot of the knowledge I gained about, you know, who flips work and, or like, they're just like a weird person. Like, I think it's good to talk to your friends about it because that really helps. Yeah, I think um, it's, uh, oh, it's also good. It, it, it's, you have to ask for kind of honesty and transparency from, let's say the gallery you're working with or you're consigning it through them. Um, I think when you're starting out, it can be really nerve wracking to, kind of like interfere with the process. Um, but I think it's really important to kind of make yourself um, be kept in the loop. And also to work with galleries that you, you trust, um, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, this question is mostly for Sasha and Amanda. Um, I'm not a visual artist, but I am I'm biracial, I'm half Korean, I'm half white, and also grew up in a predominantly white community. And it was like so lovely to hear you talk about like how like there's like now as an artist, like carving out space for this thing that you grew up that had no, like there was just no space for you and your identity. And like now you make these great, beautiful, you know, placeholders for that space. Um, I loved hearing you talk about like how you drew Lana Del Rey and like Tumblr culture and there's just like such a whiteness to that environment. And I remember when I was younger, like 
just like really doing myself so much harm, like trying to emulate like these feminine figures, like in pop culture that were like so huge at the time, like Gwen Stefani and like Lana Del Rey and Halsey, like in this Tumblr era, and like how much like those people affected now how I like view myself and like how I had to like separate myself from wanting to emulate that. So I'm curious if there was anyone like when you were growing up where you were like, like I remember I would have died to look like Blake Lively or like to be able to emulate that like feminine whiteness. Like if there was anybody in that era that you felt similarly like or the opposite, like if there was an Asian woman who was famous in pop culture and you were like, God, thank God for her. Like, thank God there's somebody I can look to. Um, Lucy Liu in Charlie's Angels. Yes, yeah. Um, Br Brenda's song in The Homecoming oh, yeah. Warrior <laughs> where they fight the terracotta people. <laughs> that was crazy. Kind of a beautiful scene. That, no, that was, cra that was really? dare I say, Asian representation. Her. <laughs> Hi, it's so wonderful to hear all of you talk about your work. Um, I am a queer figurative painter, so I'm curious to hear how your experiences within queerness have shaped how you treat figuration, how you treat the figures in your painting, and how you treat depictions of queerness within your work. Um, it's, well, for, for it, it's hard, kind of hard to quantify, I mean, I think, any kind of, um, I mean, queer people in general are more cognizant of like relation and their relationship to other people just because the forms of relationship that we have are just kind of outside what is mandated by the state, although obviously it's changing with gay marriage and stuff. Um, for, I, I'm very aware of the kind of queer figurative kind of, um, uh, contemporary queer figuration is certainly like, you know, it's like an informal grouping of artists. Um, I think what I wanted for, at least with the Coolism series, is to present a kind of kinky or like leather, kind of a more, um, how do I put this? Um, a more kind of subversive form of queerness. Um, that being said, I also, you know, I'm, I think there's a kind of expectation, um, specifically on queer men, is to paint um, certain manifestations and expression of their sexuality um, in a way that maybe is um, palatable um, for a mainstream audience. Um, and so I'm very conscious of that in um, what I paint, of trying to, you know, make it not like less like mon family, you know. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. One family, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, like, um, my partner is trans, and sometimes I make paintings, uh, portraits of her, and I have to think really carefully about that because um, I'm sort of painting a queer experience that is not necessarily my own. I'm, I'm, I'm enmeshed within it, but, um, and I think, like, you know, within the queer community, there are very many different expressions of queerness, and it is still possible to exploit others and yourself while being queer. So, um, being thoughtful um, about, you know, knowing that you will capitalize off of this image of queerness and not to just wield it as a means of capital in a moment when it's very hot and trendy right now. It's the you know, the easiest thing to paint if you're, if you're queer. Um, so it's like, how do you add uh, care and meaning to something that is um, very easily uh, exploited? Yeah, I guess um, I kind of just want my characters and my paintings to feel free and um, because I repress so much, it's, um, really important, like the connection that each of the characters have with each other. And um, I think from like our perspectives, it's more honest. Thank you. I just wanna add that I, because of just my, who, who I am, just friends with mainly queer people, it's not, I would say like intentional to paint like just queer people. It's just 
kind of what I'm kind of expressing just my life and who's in it and stuff. Hello. Uh, I have social anxiety, so I have it on my notes app. <laughs> um, so you guys all work primarily in painting, and although like it's the most representative medium of art, like people when they think of art, they think of painting a lot of people. But I see painting as like a very specific medium, like pigment on a piece of canvas or like paper. So, and me even as like an art student who is working mainly in, mainly work, working in painting, I can't really imagine solely dedicating myself to specifically painting. So um, how did you guys make that decision to, especially since you guys are very young artists, how did you make that decision to dedicate your practice to painting? Like, was it more gradual and natural? Or like, did you have impulsive urge to like branch over other mediums or like conceptual ideas? And also like, did um, you being queer, you guys all being queer, um, had like um, an impact on that, like importance of like depicting queer figures pictorially or whatnot? Did that have a significance? in making that decision? I feel like paint for me is just very effective for articulating what I want to say. Um, and also just oil paint, we all do oil, right? Yeah, oil paint is just like a very finicky material and I think no matter like how good you're at with oil paint, you're still gonna like fuck up and keep learning from it. So it's just like this material that I kind of have this like hate love relationship with and it keeps pulling me back um yeah yeah painting is um i mean i came from a drawing like as a kid i came from a drawing background so painting is just the thing that i'm currently the best at doing so it was good to sort of rely on that to yeah like what sasha said articulate some things ideas effectively i think as time goes on i'm realizing that um I don't want to be sort of known as just a, a painter. I would like to branch into other mediums and sort of make uh, films or installations or sort of other uh, intangible, work with other intangible media that is less easily um, capitalized on. I think I'm at a point right now where like an all painting show um, is becoming less and less attractive to me. Like, you know, as a, being invited to a group show that's all painting because um, it's like, okay, the gallery is making money right now so that they can fund other shows that um, aren't as profitable. A painting will forever be sort of the art object. And um, I think if you seek out opportunities to work in different mediums and work with galleries that will, are willing to take risks, you actually end up meeting a lot of really interesting conceptual artists and curators and things like that. Uh, I've ex I've done kind of photographic work, uh, conceptual work, and video work in high school as experimenting, and I also do drawings as well. But painting, yeah, I just kind of fell in love with it. It's it's awesome. It's it's so I find a lot of pleasure in it, and it is kind of like it, it, it can work against you. It, um, it's just for me been the thing that I was best at, and because you kind of. It's a really interesting medium. You keep doing it and then you get better at it. And like, you're so far ahead in this medium, it's like, fuck, I can't go back to the other ones. Um, so for me, that's kind of why. And similar to what Sash was saying, it's the best way to articulate kind of what I want to express. Thank you. Hello. Um, my question was, who are the people in like your world or that are in your team that help you produce your concept or help you sh figure out how to show your work? And what are their roles and how did you meet these people? And are they found in school or are they found elsewhere? And like what's, yeah, like what are your relationship with the people that help handle or help work with you with your work? There's like, uh, professional people who help with all the logistics and stuff. And then there's like friends who you can bounce ideas off and concepts and things like that. Um, so yeah, because I think, I think all of us have, all of us are pretty like independent studio practices. Like I don't think any of us have like assistance or um, aid in fabrication or whatever. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, friends, people I respect, I ask 
for you know their ideas on a particular thing, or we kind of share like books or like films or essays or stuff like that. Um, and not just people who are artists as well, kind of you know just my friends who you kind of have conversations with and that can spark uh, something. Yeah, my my partner and I um, share a lot of books, or I would actually say I steal a lot of her books. <laughs> She's in academia, so I think it helps for me to like check the soundness of my um, of anything I'm working on that's conceptual with her. And also, you know, we talk a lot and hang out a lot. I mean, it's not, I feel like it's not always like, um, like you know, like beat Nick's like huddled over a table, like chain smoking and be like, so what are your ideas today? You know, <laughs> it's like a lot of it is also about hanging out and not talking about art. And through that, you see a more holistic version of the person that um, is more revealing than talking about art sometimes. Yeah, because tanning is so isolating sometimes. So isolating. And like, I really just FaceTime my friends the whole day. Um, I think it's really important to like live life and live, laugh, love and <laughs> I mean, talk to people. You guys are in the same <laughs> studio building as well. What's that like? It's really nice. You know? Yeah, I mean, I have a few other friends in the building, but Amanda's the only one on my floor, and you know, same age, so we just smoke and chat. Yeah. I think just one more question. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for like organizing this and being part of this conversation. And um, I was wondering, I've like a two-part question. One is more practical. Um, like as someone who might not like be in an BFA or MFA program or like have access to like the New York community, um, how like would you uh, go about like finding an agent who you feel like shares your values? Um, and B, I like you kind of um, all talked about like um, like the psychological effects of like being a minority and how that comes out in your work. And I was just wondering like as artists who are sharing. Um, parts of yourself, what your like relationship to um, like self-hatred and like confidence might be and like your process. That's, that's a big question. <laughs> what was the first part of the question again? Um, it was just like, um, how did you go about finding an agent and maybe if you aren't like plugged into the art world, I guess. Right. Uh, I would say, I benefited a lot. I wouldn't be where I am if I wasn't in New York. But like college um, wasn't as important as being in New York City. It's not to say that I was like out all the time or like being part of the scene or whatever. It was more being able to be present when people visited and stuff um, to show my work. But sec but second, I would always say that New York is always going to be here. I mean, not. Once the waters rise and roll on the water, it's a different story. But um, I mean, Amanda came went to London for two years and she came back, and New York was always waiting for you. So New York will always wait. It will always be here. I think it'd be, it's good to um, have everything kind of good and going and then get to New York. Um, I mean, Sasha, you were in, in Providence. Um, a while. Yeah, and that's not like the hub of art. So <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, it's like, I think. No rush. Like I, I have a lot of friends who, you know, like stayed in uh, the town that we went to school in for like a few years, and then moved to New York. And um, it's really good to have like studio visits. I think I feel like that's how I met a lot of people and connected with a lot of people. Yeah, a studio visit is a good way to just ask someone if they want to hang out outside of like any other context. It's like kind of sort of outside of social bounds. The studio visit. Um, and um, I am actually not represented by anyone, so I'm asking the same thing, you know, like how do I find someone who's really good to work with? And there, that is one thing where there's definitely no rush. If you can, you know, um, if you're interested in sort of managing yourself, um, then that relationship should come very naturally. I should feel like someone who is a friend and sort of a trustworthy mentor, someone who's, you know, can offer you something that you don't already already know, but someone you would also like to actually enjoy having a drink with. Um, and so, you know, that will always, that can always um, wait until it's the right relationship. And what was the second part of the question? Oh, yeah. um, 
The second part is about how you might have um, navigated confidence in sharing your vision, um, especially like if you grew up as a minority when um, like your voice wasn't really important, like how were you able to like find that confidence and like overcome the psychological effects of like uh, potentially being like just considered a minority? I think it's, I think for me it's kind of this nagging feeling that um, it's kind of it's kind of the opposite. I feel it's it's, it's like um, is my work just being appreciated because it's like Gaijin work? Like is that it? Like it's just trendy. Um, so part of that is kind of um, I don't know. I don't know if either of you feel it. Well, kind of what we mentioned before about you know the market, the current socio political climate being favorable to um, you know East Asian figurative artists, um, the art market. Um, so I, I think the kind of lack of confidence, it's almost like a, it's, it's kind of opposite to what you're implying is this idea that, you know, it's like imposter syndrome. Is it like, are we just doing well because we're minorities? Because they want to they want to give us like a, a chance or they want to like, um, or like, you know, they're, pat they're patronizing us. Um, and I think a way just to kind of combat that, which I think any kind of minority in, um, as they're kind of rising, they, they feel that way. I think a part of it is just kind of having, you know, belief in your own work, and um, kind of what, what I mentioned before is uh, like treating yourself seriously uh, as an artist. Thank you. I'd like to thank Sasha, Amanda, and Oscar for their <laughs> generously sharing their art and thoughts this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eugenie. Thank you. Before we transition to the signing, I would also like to extend deep gratitude to our three artists for sharing so generously with us tonight. Thank you also to Eugenie Sai and Indira Biskaroon, whose vision made tonight's program possible. Thank you to everyone behind the scenes, Teddy, Kim, Didem, Noah, Jamila, Amir, and Romina. And most of all, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. We will be creating two lines for book buying and book signing. Please queue to my left to buy a book, uh, buy a copy of the book if you haven't already, and to my right to get your copy signed if you'd like that. Thank you, and have a beautiful rest of your night. <laughs>